Okay, I have known the next speaker for a year or more, something like that. I don't know, can't remember. Many people I have met with Parkinson's disease because I do run a Parkinson's disease information and referral center. Many people that I know speak very highly of our next speaker, Megan Dupuy. And though Megan is certified as an LSVT loud instructor, which means something in the Parkinson's disease community, she believes there's a lot more to speech and swallow therapy than LSVT, which I really appreciate that opinion a lot, especially in the atypical Parkinsonism world where LSVT is, is, is not our cup of tea. So as you, will, as you will see, she's a proponent of at-home exercise, whatever the diagnosis. She's the senior speech language pathologist at Stanford's Neuro Rehabilitation Department. Before coming to Stanford, she practiced at Mills Peninsula. And before that, she was in Boston. And one of the things she was doing in Boston was primary progressive aphasia research. And I think Dr. Litvan talked about that a couple times today. So um, Megan will be speaking on swallowing and speech in atypical Parkinsonism disorders. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Robin, for having me, and, and thank you for everybody for having me. Um, I'll just say one thing before I, I begin. Um, I am technically still on maternity leave, so that means I not only have 11 week old at home, I have a 22 month at home. So if I forget anything, this is the first <laughs> in professional engagement I've been to in a while. Please <laughs> remind me. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to get through a year worth of grad school in 40 minutes. So I'm going to go pretty quick, and if you have any questions, of course, write them down, and I'll try to answer them at the end. Um, today, what we're going to go over is swallowing speech and voice um, and also language in all of the disorders that we have talked about today. Um, there are a lot of similarities, uh, but there are some um, differences as well that, that we'll cover. I don't want to focus too much on the voice, speech, and language aspect because dysphagia or swallowing, as you um, heard the doctor say this morning, is really the meat of what we, we need to cover because it is most important to your health, to your family member's health. And, and most often, I know I, I heard the question this morning raised, do, do people um, end up passing away from these diseases? And the, the answer is no, it's usually the comorbidity, something that has happened um, in, because of the disease. A lot of times, uh, you know, I don't know what the exact percentage is on this, but in many, many, many cases, it is aspiration pneumonia that is the cause of death um, when it comes to um, any of the atypical Parkinson's, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so if we can address that early and prevent aspiration from occurring, um, that's how you're going to live longer and happier and have a better quality of life. Um, so to start off with, I just want to give a, t a couple takeaways throughout the presentation. But to start off with, um, I want to say that speech, language, voice, um, swallowing, all these things are interconnected. These aren't four different things because anatomically they all come from, you know, you're using the same structures for all of these things. Your larynx, pharynx, um, your, your airways, your lungs, they, these are the, the anatomical structures that you're using. Um, your tongue, mouth, cheeks, lips, these are things you use to speak, but it's also things you need to chew, you need to swallow. Um, and obviously if you can't use those things, language um, is going to be a problem as well, meaning you may know what you want to say in, in your head, but if you can't use speech to say it, yeah, you're going to need a, a different form of communication. So just keep in mind, all of these things are interconnected. That means if you have one, if you have a speech problem, you will most likely have a swallowing problem in the future if you don't already have it, and vice versa. So keep that in mind. Um, 
Speech and voice changes, again, in Parkinson's and atypical, we're going to go just a broad overview here. Um, scaled down output, reduced volume is a biggie. You know, a lot of times people will come in, patients will come into my office and say, I don't think I have anything going on, but, you know, it's really strange. I can't get my volume up. I'm speaking so softly. Right then, if a light bulb goes off in my head, like the doctor was saying this morning, she hears things, what people say, and automatically she starts thinking, oh, that I know what this is. I know where we're going here. If I hear volume in the background of some, in someone's history, automatically I'm thinking this is related to Parkinsonism, some form. Um, and it's not because there is any anatomical issue with the with your voice or your speech it is because it's the perception of your voice that has changed so a lot of times it's not that someone cannot speak louder it is that they don't perceive themselves as speak, speaking quietly so you know you'll say you know mr jones say ah at the top of your lungs and they'll say, ah, right back at you. And you're like, I don't see any difficulty with volume. What's going on here? So again, it's perception. And as we're going through the next few slides, just keep in mind it's the perception, not an anatomical changes that, that's causing the problem in a lot of, a lot of cases. Uh, vocal tremor, hoarse breath, hoarse or breathy quality of voice, kind of like you're sick. Sounds like you're sick, but all the time. Or a monotone voice is a, a very, very common thing we see too. And a monotone voice goes along with all the pragmatics of speech, right? So if you have a monotone voice, what also tends to be different about you? Anybody? Your, your breathing, your facial expression. So if somebody's talking like this all the time, a lot of times their face doesn't move too. And of course, we associate that a lot with Parkinson's disease and the quote-unquote masked faces that, that you see. But it happens as well with these other, other um, diseases as well. So, Okay, start with PSP. And again, we're going to run through the voice, speech, and language quickly so we can get to the heart of the dysphagia issue here. But um, PSP, what we see is primarily in voice and speech. That's where, where we see a lot of uh, the disorders. And we see ataxic or spastic speech. And ataxia, when we talk about limb, uh, limb um, apraxia or ataxic movements in the body, similar in voice and speech, and we'll get to that. Mutism. Now, this is a, you know, a clinical observance. And I don't necessarily like the term mutism because a lot of times someone is, well, in most cases I've seen, People aren't technically mute. They have the ability to speak, but again, it's an initiation um, deficit. And so it can be so severe, initiation deficit, that yes, someone isn't speaking. But I was speaking to someone at our table earlier um, about melodic intonation therapy and about how sometimes people can sing and they can't speak. The reason for that, just real quickly, again, touch on this, is speaking is controlled in the left hemisphere of your brain. So for most right-handed individuals, your speech language centers are in the, in the left hemisphere of your brain versus the music center of your brain is right hemisphere. So if there are atrophy or degeneration into, in the left hemisphere, and the right hemisphere is primarily preserved, people can sing and yet they can't speak. So someone might come in with a family member and say, my, my uh, wife hasn't spoken to me in three years. And I'll say, okay, you know, let's try singing happy birthday. They might be able to sing happy birthday with me, and then we can translate that into speech. You use happy birthday to say, my name is. So you can use that for speech. Um, swallowing, this is going to be across the board. You're going to see it in all of them. So again, we'll, we'll touch on that at, at the end. Um, so CBD, the main component or the defining factor is really language. You have more of a language deficit. You have an aphasia, which is the word finding, um, messing up what you want to say. You might know what you want to say, but it's not coming out the way you want to say it. 
or perseveration. And perseveration is as if your brain is stuck in the mud. It's like a tractor tire getting stuck in the mud and you're just saying the same things over and over and over and over again. You can't get unstuck. Um, and so if you see somebody that just, you know, you ask them a question and it's almost like they're stuttering on it. They're just saying it over and over again. That's, a, that's perseveration. Um, and then we have things that may not be speech or language related, but they affect communication. So why would I have limb apraxy up there? Well, if you lose the ability to speak, then you're going to need an alternative or assistive communication device. And what do you need for most of them? Your hands, your arms, you need your limbs to, to communicate. And so it's very difficult to use those devices. The things that are on the market now, a lot of them are applications. That's the newest trend um, that you need to type with. And so limopraxia can be a, a very um, difficult thing to deal with. Okay, um, MSA. So MSA, we see a lot of the same things that we see in a, a typical Parkinson's disease patient. So we have the mass face, the inability to close the mouth, the rigidity, um, reduced facial expressions, monotone, slow speech. So the video that we saw this morning of the woman who was speaking was very deliberate and very slow. A lot of times you'll hear somebody speak and it's like they are robotic in nature or they are slow to get the words out. It's like you want to fill it in for them. It's like you, you've had the conversation if you have someone in your life like this. And as a therapist, I have conversations like this all day, every day. So my husband kills me because I want to always try to fill in for him. But, you know, where you're getting closer and closer, like, come on, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, and I'll tell you what you can do about that in a little bit. But um, that's that, that slow speech or low volume, again, the hypertonia. All right, so dementia with Lewy bodies. What are the defining features of that when it comes to speech and language? A lot of it is memory and cognitive deficits. Again, the, this is falling into that category of frontotemporal dementias. And this is where I did a lot of my research in this same uh, beast, if you want to, if you want to call it that. Primary progressive aphasia falls very closely in this too. So you have cognitive deficits, memory deficits, more closely related to the Alzheimer's type presentation. Um, and many of the other Parkinson's type disorders do not have that component as strong. Um, so cognitive therapy might focus on problem solving, analytics, you know, trying to in initiate memory, abstract thinking, those types of things. Okay, so we're going to hit on a couple very difficult topics today, and this is one of them. What happens when my wife, my husband, can't speak anymore? This is something nobody wants to talk about, and it's always something I force talking about in sometimes the evaluation of a patient, if not the first um, therapy session, because this is what we're planning for. I mean, it is sometimes an inevitable truth, something that's coming, and if we don't plan for it now, you're not going to be ready when it happens, and if you're not prepared, then that's when you can no longer communicate. If you prepare for these things to happen, communication can continue quite functionally until the day that someone passes away. So, um, you know, planning is, is key. And in everything we talk about today, planning is key. You know, prevention and planning are the two big pieces. And that's why every single person in the room, caregivers and patients, everybody should be doing exercises, should be doing cognitive exercises, speech exercises, memory exercises, doing the exercises that oral motor exercises. It, it's beneficial for everybody despite what your diagnosis or if you are a completely healthy functioning person. All right. 
Um, and we'll also get to some alternative communication devices at the end. I'm going to hold all my videos to the end just in case we run into any technical difficulties with the videos. So I'm going to show you just a couple videos of, of um, some applications that I think are really useful or on the market today um, that you can use. Um, but now we're going to get to the meat of it. Okay, dysphagia. So I'm going to put down the clicker for a minute because I always... This is from my acute care days, the quick and dirty illustration of what this is. So when anybody has a neurological deficit, your swallowing will be probably one of the first things that will be impacted. This is so much so that in most emergency rooms now there's a swallowing protocol. Anybody who comes in with a sign of a neurological deficit, they're put through a swallowing screening, a swallowing protocol. Um, ER physicians are on the front lines of doing this, especially at stroke centers, um, because if something goes down the wrong pipe, you, un you can get aspiration, meaning something gets into your lungs, and there's no way to get something out of your lungs. It sits in there, and it cause if it develops, if, if, if something more gets in there, or if it just sits in there and sit with bacteria, it develops into an infection, and that's aspiration, and it forms aspiration pneumonia. So th this is the easy way to think of it. When you swallow, you have two tubes that go down right next to each other. One goes to your lungs, and one goes to your stomach, right? The one that goes to your lungs is covered by a flap called your epiglottis. So it's a flap that moves like this. So whenever the nerves are affected, that flap sometimes doesn't move like it should. It doesn't move up and down as fast as it should. Sometimes it's slow to move. Sometimes it gets stuck sitting like this. Whatever it is, anything that's wrong with that flap, even the slightest little problem, food or liquid can get around, especially liquid, like the doctor was saying, can get around that flap into your lungs, and that causes aspiration. So that flap is really the only thing that divides your stomach from your lungs. And if that flap is not working, again, for any number of reasons, or if it's even working but not perfectly, you can be at risk for aspiration. And not only people with neurological disorders, but how many people in this room say, <coughs> it went down the wrong pipe. You have that embarrassing coughing moment at the restaurant, you know, in front of your friends where you just can't stop coughing. You say, I got something down the wrong pipe. That's aspiration. We all aspirate. Every single person aspirates several times a day, actually. But when there's a neurological deficit, the difference is it happens repeatedly, and it happens in larger amounts. So you get larger amounts in there, and it happens over and over and over again. So even if they're even if it's a teeny amount, but it's happening over and over and over again, that fluid's going to build up in your lungs. It's going to cause an infection, and that's what aspiration pneumonia is. So a lot of times what happens, especially when I was working in acute care, you saw this, is somebody will come in for an aspiration pneumonia. They will treat it with antibiotics. They'll go home, and they'll be back with aspiration pneumonia the next month, and two months after that, six months, and nine months, and eventually they end up passing away from aspiration pneumonia. It's a cycle. It happens. Once, it, once we see someone that gets it one time, they get it over and over and over if they don't get proper treatment. That's why it's so important to get the treatment. So what do you do about it? First of all, first thing you do is prevent it from happening. If it never happens, you never have to worry about treating it. So how do you prevent it from happening? There are a number of exercises that we can do to prevent this from happening. And I'm sorry if I'm going off the slide here. Let's see where we are. Um, we'll come back to this actually in a minute. But let's keep going here. So there, I want to just get to the exercises while we're on this topic. So what can you do to prevent it? So what you can do is, I gave you a short list here of some exercises for the tongue, lips, jaw, palate. These are super simple. You can do them on, you know, on your drive to work, on your way to therapy, on your, you know, in the shower, while you're watching your favorite TV show. You don't have to set aside time to do them. You can do them while you're doing something else. It's a good multitasking, uh, good multitasking therapy technique. Um, and so we're just going to do a couple of the ones that I give to everybody. I won't make you go through this whole regime. They're very simple to follow, but I want to show you a couple of them. And I guarantee you people that have any form of a, 
uh, of a neurological deficit, whether it be Parkinson's or otherwise, are, is going to have a very difficult time with some of these. And even people who don't are going to have somewhat of a difficult time. And I have a lot of people ask me, well, if I'm having difficulties, does that mean I have a neurological deficit? No, not necessarily. These are difficult. They're meant to be difficult because they, we want them to work. So the one we're going to focus on here with the tongue is the one where you're going to open your mouth as wide as you can. You're going to touch the tip of your tongue to the roof of your mouth. Do not let your lower jaw move. If your lower jaw moves, even the slightest bit, that means you are not in full control of your tongue. Your tongue is not as strong as it should be. So you're going to open your mouth. and stick your tongue. Now look at the person next to you, as, as crazy as they may look, and tell them, is their lower jaw moving? If you see their lower jaw moving, they need to work on the strength of their tongue. So a lot of times people cannot see it or they don't feel it for themselves. So you need to do this in front of a bathroom mirror. If your lower jaw moves, hold it with your hand and practice because it's to strengthen your tongue. So that's one that I highly recommend for everybody because it works on the lateral muscles of your tongue and the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles. The other one's very simple. Um, and you'd think I would be embarrassed doing this in front of a room full of people, but I do this in front of people every day, so I think my embarrassment has gone out the window. So another one that is really important to do or a really good one that kind of covers all the bases for the tongue is the one where you're going to take your tongue and you're going to move it clockwise around your teeth so i'll demonstrate i don't know if everyone can see i'll do it this way and then do it this way so so keep your lips closed do not let your lips open again if your lips if your tongue you can see your tongue coming through your lips you know you have a lip you know weakness it's like that. So just roll your, your tongue over the top teeth, bottom teeth, top teeth, bottom teeth in a circular motion. If the movement is sporadic, if it looks like back, forth, back, forth, you know, that's a, that's a f form of a movement disorder. And so your tongue, just like the rest of your arms, your legs, your body, your tongue can have movement disorders. So you need to work, as, work on that slow, coordinated movement. So you're working on range of motion, speed, and coordination. Now, if you get it going one direction, you're like, yes, I can do this. I don't have any problem. I'm awesome at this. Try going the other way. Try reversing it. So go one way, stop, go the other way, and do it as fast as you can. Go five one direction, five the other direction, five one direction, five the uh, I guarantee you one side's going to be harder than the other side. But this is really good for strength, coordination, all those things. And again, you can do them kind of silently while you're driving, maybe standing in line for bank, you know, whatever. You don't have to make a big deal out of it, but you can do them. Okay, lips and cheek. We're just going to do a couple out of, uh, or just one or two out of each one of these. So lips and cheek. So smile, pucker, smile, pucker. So let's put them together. The end result of this should be smile, pucker, smile, pucker, smile, pucker. And just do it over and over and over and over and over. You're going to work the cheek muscles and your lip muscles. So a lot of times I have patients that come in that have uh, the disease has progressed quite a ways and they cannot make these facial expressions. Their face is, is so rigid, their muscles are so rigid that I say, smile, and this is what it looks like. <laughs> and I say, are you smiling? And they're like, I'm doing the best I can. So if that's the case, have, have whoever it is, yourself or your family member, Take your hand and physically pull your cheeks back to a smile and then let go and see if you can hold it there. So you're just trying to get that movement back. So you want to get that movement in your face. This is not only good for swallowing, speech, language, all those things, but pragmatics too. You want to be able to smile. You want to be able to frown because if you're having a conversation with you, that's how people are going to read you. You know, that's how social interaction works. And so you want to work on those, those qualities. Um, okay, for voice, sing. Sing, 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 sing as much as you can. That's all you have to remember. Sing in the shower, sing in the car. I don't care what you sing. You can be the worst singer in the entire world. 
Believe me, I have had some of the worst singers in the entire world that come to speech therapy, and we do not have padded walls. So if anybody has been to Stanford's rehab, you have heard screaming coming from my room. And a lot of times, you know, I'll get, I have had this happen so many times, and I feel so bad for families when it happens because they're embarrassed when it happens. But how many times I've had people come knock on my door, <gasps> Do you need help? Is everything okay? I'm like, we're okay. We're just screaming. It's all right. But just sing, scream if that's if that's all you think you can do. But get your voice projected. Get that sing-songy quality into your voice. Sing happy birthday. Sing Mary had a little lamb. Sing anything you can can remember because it does help. And, oh, here's why. The reason it helps. When you sing, your larynx moves up and down. And so those muscles in your throat have to pull your laryngeal muscles up, have to pull your laryngeal muscles down, and, and it moves these up and down for the coordination strength, all, all the flexibility, all the same things again. So sing high pitch, low pitch, sing just scales, up the scale, down the scale. It'll get this going and get this flexible in here. Okay, swallowing. There's a million swallowing um, exercises you can do. And they're very specific to disorder. So this may not work for everybody, but this is kind of my favorite go-to swallowing for somebody who may not know what's going on or they just have a, a more generalized neurological issue. So Mendelssohn maneuver. Now you have to practice this at home too. It's not going to happen right away. But the idea is you're going to swallow halfway. When your swallow gets to the height of the swallow, well, okay, let's back up here for one minute. Everybody put your hand on your throat and swallow. And somebody tell me what happens. Okay, yes, Adam's apple goes up and down. So if you're feeling something go up and down, good. So when you swallow halfway, you're going to hold that larynx at the height of your swallow. So you're going to stop your swallow essentially halfway. Hold your muscles tight, as tight as they can be. Count to two, one, two in your head. Drop your larynx down. Let it relax. So again, you're going to swallow halfway. Hold your larynx up. Hold everything tight. Drop it down. The reason this works so well is because even just by tightening all these muscles, you're strengthening your laryngeal muscles. By tightening them, strengthening them, you're going to help improve your swallowing. Okay, so I know we went off course a little bit with the exercises, but they're important. You can follow all the exercises I have. They're in your packet. So like I said, everyone should be doing them every single day. Um, okay, what do you need to know about dysphagia? What, what changes are you going to see? Okay, what is dysphagia? Dysphagia, again, um, is a reduction in airway protection. So dysphagia is a term for a swallowing disorder. Aspiration is the result of dysphagia. So those aren't the same things. Aspiration is what happens when you have dysphagia. So dysphagia is a, re a reduction in the airway protection. It can be due to the epiglottic flip. It can be due to a lot of different things, but primarily it's due to the epiglottic flip or in Parkinson's or Parkinson's related disorders, what we see a lot is that there's a decrease in sensation in the laryngeal walls. So what does that mean? You eat a piece of steak, it goes down the wrong way, you don't feel it. it you don't have any sensation. You don't even know you're aspirating. You don't cough. So in a lot of, a lot of um, cases, and I know this is kind of skipping ahead again, but um, aspiration is not always obvious. Aspiration can be silent. So you can aspirate without coughing, without choking, without throat clearing, which are the signs we're going to see on the next slide. But you can aspirate without these things happening. If you're silently aspirating, it is the worst form because it means you are not able to detect when it's happening and you're not able to prevent it. The only way to prevent it is to just do the exercises anyway. So even if you don't think you have a swallowing disorder, do your exercises because it can't hurt. You might, you know, it might be beneficial in the future. Um, that's called silent aspiration. When there's decreased sensation, you can't feel it. It goes down the wrong pipe. And you can't, no detection. So what do you look for if silent aspiration is not the case, if you don't have a decrease in sensation? These are the things you look for. Drooling, difficulty chewing food, keeping food in your mouth, excessive chewing, pooling in the sides of your mouth, or pocketing food is very common, 
Watery eyes or nose. A big one people don't usually check for at home, but you should check for is have someone drink, let's say water, thin liquid, and then have them say, ah, right after. If it sounds like they're gurgling water afterwards, they are probably aspirating. So real easy check, drink water, say, ah, if it's not perfectly clear, if you hear a you know, like gurgly sound, go see a specialist immediately. So that's an easy check. Okay, shortness of breath, that's another one. If, if every time you eat or you, your family member eats, you notice they're getting short of breath, they're probably aspirating. Um, if they have recurrent respiratory, re respiratory infections or weight loss, probably aspiration. So a lot of times what will happen is, um, again, patients will go to an emergency room, they'll be diagnosed with aspiration, they'll be, they'll be put on an antibiotic and sent home, and they'll never go see a therapist. And so again, it's that cycle. It's not that the problem has been solved at all, it's just being remediated for the time being, and then it's gonna come back. So if you or anyone you know has had an aspiration pneumonia even once in their life, go get checked out, get, get the a modified barium swallow or a, a FEES, which it stands for fiber optic endoscopic eval of swallowing, to see is there something going on, weak, is there a weakness that you can prevent at a future aspiration pneumonia. Okay, we went over this, aspiration is not always obvious. This is a picture of your vocal cords. So here, those are healthy white vocal cords. These are your false folds, your false, false vocal cords. If you're aspirating, what aspiration means is food or liquid gets beyond the level of these cords. So what that means is food or liquid goes into the airway here. Can you guys see on the... So it goes into, beyond those, those cords. So there's something called, you might hear the term penetration. A lot of people will penetrate. What that means is if it gets into this round cup right here, this circular area, from the, the, these, uh, I don't know, it's hard to kind of see on, these, on this picture, but there's a, your false folds start here. If liquid gets into this area, it's called penetration. If it does not go beyond the level of vocal cords, it's still considered penetration. If it goes beyond the level of vocal cords, it's considered aspiration. Aspiration is the one you want to really be wary of. Okay, so management, what do you do? Go see your physician, tell them you want to see a speech therapist. Physicians are phenomenal. And the doctor we had speak this morning talked more about swallowing and, vo and speech than any doctor I have ever heard speak on, on swallowing and voice. As wonderful as a doctor can be, they don't specialize usually in speech and swallowing. And I'll, I, you know, I always give this example. We have a very well-known neurologist that works at Stanford who is wonderful, who refers a lot of patients to our department. He has his residents come shadow the speech therapy department because he cannot teach what speech therapists are teaching his patients. He just, they don't have the specialty on it. So if you have any concern about your swallowing, please see a speech therapist. Don't just go on your doctor's advice. Is you know, as much as they want to help and, and they, they have some good advice, you're going to get more from seeing a speech therapist. What you're going to want to do when you see a speech therapist is get an, a clinical um, evaluation, meaning in-office evaluation, and then your speech therapist will say, you, need, you might need a more objective evaluation. Those objective evaluations are modified barium swallow and fees, the fiber optic endoscopic eval. A modified barium swallow is essentially an x-ray while you eat. Not painful, you don't have to starve yourself ahead of time, nothing, super easy. You come in, you get something to eat, it has a little bit of barium on it, not like an esophagram where you have a lot of barium. It just, I put a little bit of barium on, let's say, a cracker, or you have to drink a little bit of barium with juice in it. Um, and then we watch you eat, we watch you swallow, and we say, is it going down the right pipe, yes or no? And do we see any weakness in, in anatomy? And so we can tell a lot by that. Fees, the fiber optic eval is different. That's where they put an endoscope down your nose, looking at your vocal cords to determine, is there any anatomical changes here? 
They're used, those studies are not interchangeable. They're used for different things. They're used to look at different things. So if you think that you didn't get your answer with one, ask for the other because they're not going to give you the same information. Diet changes, we're not going to have time to go into all the diet changes, but just be aware that if you see a speech therapist, they might recommend thickening your liquids or modifying your food choices, soft foods, pureed foods. Everyone dreads those words, and I don't blame, you know, you know it, it's like saying physicians are the worst patients. I would be the worst patient for a speech therapist because I can't stand the sight of all the pureed food anymore. I know it's not appealing, but it might save your life. So you might want to look into it. Last thing I want to check on, I got my minute here, warning. Um, last thing I want to um, touch on, and this again could be an entire year worth of information, but feeding tubes, huge, right, for a minute. Um, should you or shouldn't you have a feeding tube? Well, it depends on who you are, what your diagnosis is, how old you are, and what your quality of life will be with or without a feeding tube. We'll talk about quality of life versus maintain, you know, just, just staying alive, basically. And so if you're, for example, you have decreased sensation, you are silently aspirating, feeding tube is a good way to go because you're not gonna be able to tell when you're aspirating and thus you'll probably aspirate a lot. The problem is here, so you should have a feeding tube that goes into your stomach to bypass this area. You can live 25, 30, 100 years beyond what you would have lived if you hadn't had a feeding tube. If, however, the problem is anatomical in, in a different nature, and I'll, I'll try to give you a specific example. Someone with a stroke, for example, might have multiple issues that are contributing to a, a feeding disorder. So it's their tongue, lips, jaws weak, they, you know, they have a hemiparesis, one side of their, their um, throat is, is numb, they have all sorts of things, movement issues going on. Then feeding tube is not always the, not always the answer. And in most cases, I'd say 90% of the time, feeding tubes are not the answer. So don't run to them. They cause, you can have site infections where the feeding tube is placed. It does not prevent aspiration. So what that means is you can still aspirate on your saliva. So your saliva is the most dangerous thing, believe it or not. It's not water, it's not food, it's your saliva because your saliva is ridden with tons of bacteria. Whether you brush your teeth 100 times a day or not, tons of bacteria. So when you swallow it and it goes down the wrong tube, it can also form an aspiration pneumonia. So if you have a severe dysphagia that causes you to aspirate your own saliva, then you are going to be at risk for aspiration, feeding tube or no feeding tube. So that's really one, what I wanted to hit on in terms of the feeding tube, and I'm sure I'll get some questions um, when it comes to that. But I have to wrap it up because we are out of time, and that's it. So Wonderful, Megan. Thank you so much. Okay, we've got a lot of questions already, and keep them coming. We've got volunteers circulating. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times about repeated aspiration pneumonia and receiving proper treatment for it. And I assume that one of the components of proper treatment is exercise. Are there any others? Okay, great question. Um, exercise, obviously, number one. Um, when it comes to repeated aspiration pneumonias, Exercise for tongue, lips, jaw, those might be obvious. But also, remember to exercise your whole body. Again, all these things are interconnected. A lot of times what I'll see is people will do all these exercises, swallowing, tongues, lips, jaw, but they'll sit on the couch and do them all day. Well, if you sit on the couch and do them all day, what's not working? Your whole respiratory system, your lungs, everything. So especially when I was in acute care, what I saw a lot is patients laying in a bed all day. And this part was not getting better as quickly as they thought it should. Why? Because all these functions are connected. So if you're not sitting up, your lungs aren't aerating, gravity works well, everybody, pulling that liquid down. So if nothing else, get up, move around, move your arms, move your legs, 
get your body moving. So you want that air to go in and out of your lungs. That's what dissipates the liquid in your lungs. And you want to be doing the swallowing exercises on top of that. So I know that still is on the side of exercise, but remember it's your whole body, not just your swallowing mechanism. Uh, this is kind of a related question to your answer. Uh, I heard once that if you're hunched over, that you have a greater likelihood of developing pneumonia if you never sit up straight. Is that true? Okay, this is a double-edged sword because when you're hunched over, think about your the rest of your respiratory system is, you know, crunched together. So when you sit up straight, your lungs are able to open up, your respiratory system is able to open up. However, that being said, it's sounding a little contradictory, one of the things we recommend a lot of times for a swallowing disorder is to put your head down. Why do we recommend that? Chin tuck, you guys have probably heard chin tuck. When you put your head down, you think about those two tubes and that epiglottis. When you put your head down, it's like putting your, it's like going into, um, you know, stick shift, what's it called? Manual, yeah. You're manually putting that epiglottis down. You put your head forward and your epiglottis is going down. So hunched over position to eat is not the worst position to eat in. So don't be overly concerned. But if you're going to be in a hunched over position and you cannot, first thing you want to do is try to straighten, straighten the torso. If you cannot straighten the torso, make sure that not just their body is hunched over, but get them to put their head down as well because that will help prevent the aspiration. Uh, my wife sometimes feels like she is choking on excess saliva. Is there anything we can do about that? So a lot of times in the, the Parkinson's group of, of disorders, what happens is it's people think they're producing too much saliva or they're getting too much saliva protection. It's not the case in most, most circumstances. What happens is because there's a decrease in sensation, you're not feeling the saliva that you're producing, and hence you're not swallowing that saliva as regularly as we all do. So we all sl swallow our saliva every few seconds. Every few seconds we swallow our saliva without thinking about it. But what happens with Parkinson's or Parkinson's-related disorders is that sensation is gone, so you're not swallowing. So you, in, you might be swallowing every three seconds normally. Now you might be swallowing every two minutes. And when you swallow every two minutes, you're going to have a lot of saliva that's that's pooled in your mouth, so you're going to choke on it because you have a lot of saliva that's in there. So the best thing I tell people um, that say they feel like they're choking on saliva and they're not managing your saliva is try to train yourself to swallow every few seconds again. And that means for a day or two days, set those days aside and say, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to make myself swallow every few seconds to retrain your body, your mind into thinking you have to swallow your saliva every few seconds. Another really good tip for doing that is um, using cough drops or gum to get you to produce the, um, it gives you more of a taste sensation, so you swallow your own saliva. So sometimes it helps if you chew gum. Does the patient need to state his or her choice to get or refuse a feeding tube in an advanced care directive? Oh, geez. <laughs> now, someone in this room, I'm sure, can answer this better than I can. I'm not a specialist on feeding tubes, and um, it would fall more under a GI specialist, a GI doctor, when it comes to feeding tubes. Um, but what, and I'll I'll have someone else answer that question in a minute when it comes to advanced care directives. But what I I do want to stress when it comes to feeding tubes, and I think I heard the word choice in there, the idea of choice, is. As a patient, if you are functioning, uh, you know, you're, you're mentally functioning um, at a, a certain level, you always have a choice. So if a doctor or a speech therapist recommends a feeding tube, that does not mean that you need to get a feeding tube. I would actually highly recommend that you argue the reasons why you do not need a feeding tube before you get a feeding tube. So many times, and this is the political game of working in a hospital, a GI specialist will recommend a feeding tube because it's a surgery and because they get more money for it. So, and I hate to say that because some of the GI specialists I work with are amazing, but that's just the reality of it. So they'll recommend a feeding tube because 
that's what they you know would like to do from that angle but argue it why do i need this feeding tube what's the benefits what are the drawbacks and if if again you're mentally able to make that that decision then then you always have a choice but go ahead And one thing I rec highly recommend everybody in this room do is fill out a post. Does people hear about that or know? So on a post form, which somebody help me, physician. Orders on life-saving or treatment. Correct. Okay. So it has a, a question on there regarding feeding tubes. So you can you can go that route as well and the pulse will follow you throughout your you can take a copy with you wherever you go and if you go into you know a different physician if you're on vacation or you go into the emergency room you can hand that to them and that's also another way to express your wish wishes on a feeding tube okay let's move on i have heard speech therapists recommend against using a straw but using a straw seems to help my dad control his liquid intake versus one pouring it in from a cup, and also exercise for his mouth sucking. What is your take on straws? Mm -hmm. So for 90% of the, the patients out there, I say no, no straw, because what happens, this, I'll tell you why. When you, when you drink from a straw, we all aspirate when we drink from straws. It is the most dangerous thing, because what happens is, think about it, you're sucking in, where is it going? not to the front of your mouth, so you don't have time to control it in your oral cavity, it's going to the back of your mouth, <coughs> which gives you only a couple seconds, not even, a, three seconds is a normal swallow, but when you drink with a straw, you don't even have that three seconds. It goes to the back of your mouth, and your swallow has to be functioning perfectly and super fast. And if those things aren't happening, then you are at high risk of aspirating when you drink from a straw. So straws are generally very dangerous. However, if somebody has a movement disorder where you know, their head is not able to be in control and they do not have a swallowing disorder that they know of, which is rare, but I have seen it, where their swallowing is still fairly intact or strong, but they have more of a movement disorder of their head, not trunk, um, then using a straw, yes, is more functional. Obviously, if they're laying in bed and they're moving around, drinking from a cup is very difficult. Now, I know a lot of people think this is, um, you know, hard to do socially, but the best thing you can do is not drink from a straw, but put, you know, a coffee mug or with the little sippy spout on it so it regulates the flow of the liquid and doesn't spill all over them but you're not using a straw because then the liquid still goes to the front of your mouth you're not projecting the liquid to the back of your mouth but you're able to regulate the liquid and it's not spilling on you there's a cup called i think it's called a tipsy cup they use it for kids and adults that it's one of the no spill when you flip it upside down it won't spill but it comes out pretty easily as well. So you can look into that. My diagnosis is CBD. I've noticed I have more trouble swallowing pills or dry foods. Feels like it gets stuck in my upper throat and takes longer and more water to swallow. Swallowing liquid seems to be okay. Is there a problem? Um, okay, so there could be two things going on most likely. One is that you're not producing enough saliva to, to give that pill or food enough you know liquid to go down your larynx on but the more common or oh, i don't want to say more common but um, one of the things you might want to get checked out whoever wrote that question is get a modified barium swallow and check to make sure that there's no abnormality in the posterior pharyngeal wall there are people a lot of people have what's called zanker's diverticulum which is a weakness in the posterior pharyngeal wall, which forms a pocket uh, in your throat. So when you swallow, people complain of pills or solid foods feeling stuck in their throat. Well, it's because it does get stuck in your throat. There, there's a pocket that actually forms where pills or food will actually sit in that pocket and just get stuck there. And then when you drink liquid, it washes it out. So if you do have that problem, ask for a modified barium swallow to make sure that that's not the case. How often should a modified barium swallow be performed? Um, as little as possible. Obviously, when you get a modified barium swallow, you are being exposed to radiation. No exposure to radiation is good. So 
you don't want to have them more frequently than you absolutely need to have them and have your speech therapist make that recommendation. But I would have one to get your initial diagnosis and then only have another one if you have significant changes for the worse. How often should a patient have a chest x-ray to check for aspiration? Same thing. Um, that goes along the same lines. Again, radiation exposure. You don't want to have any procedure that you don't absolutely need. So I wouldn't say you need a chest x-ray. Have a nurse um, or a physician listen to your lung status. If they hear, if you hear the words crackles or rails or ronchi, those are key words you want to listen for. If, if you hear fluid basically on your lungs, then you might want to follow up with a chest x-ray to make sure that it's not an aspiration pneumonia. But if they don't hear anything that's concerning, I would not worry about it. Is the speech therapist involved in the decision for a tracheostomy when aspiration pneumonia happens too frequently? Okay, so this is an interesting question because someone should never have a tracheostomy when aspiration is happening too frequently. A lot of times it's the opposite. Someone will have a trach and then they will have risk for aspiration. Um, but no one should get a trach because trachs actually increase the risk for aspiration. They don't decrease the risk for aspiration. So the only reason someone would need a trach related to aspiration would be is, is if they had a severe respiratory distress. So they cannot breathe. They have a trach and then that allows them to, to breathe easier, but that's usually in pretty extreme cases. Okay. How uh, is it possible to help someone swallow saliva safely? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> that's the answer to that question. It, it's not possible for someone else to make that person swallow safely, but you can help in terms of making recommendations or if you are the caregiver for that person, make sure they have small bites, small sips, everything's cut up really easily for them. Um, make sure that they are aware while they are eating. So this sounds silly, but how many times do I have patients and families come in that say that, oh, you know, my husband sits in front of the TV and eats and falls asleep every night. Well, if you're falling asleep when you're eating, whether it's just due to being tired or medication or you're watching a football game, drinking beer, falling asleep, you're not protecting your airway as well as you should. So make sure the person is sitting up, there's bright lights on in the room, they are engaged, leave the TV off, try to, try to eliminate distraction. Those are some of the things you can do to help. Make sure their, their postural uh, changes are, are, are correct too. So make sure, again, their posture is as good as you can get it. How do you feel about Botox used on larynx for Strider? And can you s explain what Strider is? Okay, so this is um, a re really good question. I don't know who wrote this or if it was one of my patients that might have wrote it <laughs> recently because I've had a lot of discussion with patients about this. Okay, so when we talk about Botox for the vocal cords, a lot of times we're talking about we can be addressing a swallowing disorder or a voice disorder. When we're talking about strider, we're talking about more, it can be a combination of both, but is changes in your vocal cord quality. So when your vocal cords atrophy or when um, your vocal cords may have a paralysis to them, there can be some, and this is again uh, a long discussion, I'm trying to make very short, but if there's any abnormality of the vocal cord. Your vocal cords usually move like this in unison, and then when, when you swallow, they come together. They suction cup together. And when you voice, they again move. So when you're swallowing, you want them suction cup together. If there is any leakage like this of your vocal cords due to atrophy, you can have food or liquid go into them. It can also cause a voice disorder when there is atrophy of the vocal cords. It can cause a voice disorder. So if there's atrophy, you can get Botox to plump it back up so that there is no leakage of, you know, nothing can get through your vocal cords. So Botox can be extremely beneficial. However, Botox is expensive. You have to do it every few months. It's not a one, one and done type of thing. 
and it does not eliminate most swallowing problems. It, it, it eliminates very specific swallowing problems, and you have to see an ENT to evaluate for that. But um, so it's actually a very complicated answer. And <laughs> no, would they it's also the for now. Strider need to see an ENT? Would that be the best yes. specialist? Yes. Okay. ENT. Could you just briefly say what Strider is? So when so basically you have all these. Um, mechanisms that work, swallowing, speech, voice, respiratory support. So <gasps> how many, everyone hear that? <gasps> you know, you hear that <gasps> sound. That's due to your vocal cord, um, motility, mobility, and your respiratory support for your breathing. And that's what results in that strider. <gasps> So you're having some, some noise come through the vocal cords. It's indication that there's atrophy of the vocal cords. Again, this is going a lot into a voice type um, conversation. But if you do have any type of sound coming through when you are, bre when you are breathing, eating, speaking, or you have any type of, um, like, uh, you could also have a little bit of a tremor in your voice when, you, when you're speaking, Get evaluated for voice because, again, those are the same anatomical um, components used for swallowing. So all interconnected. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.